The show is here. Yo, our mission is clear. It's time to change health care. Have no fear. Today is the day. This is the hour. Together, you know we've got the power. Drop the silos. We're all the same team. Patients, docs, nurses, tech, and marketing. How can anyone be satisfied with the way things have always been? Yeah, we've tried. So join us now. Join the revolution. Digital health is the evolution. Status quo, more like status no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rap. Y'all come on, let's go. New choices, new platforms, new care models. In the healthcare of tomorrow, consumers win. But who will design it? What will it look like? And how long will it take? We're here to answer those questions with some provocative thinking about how to create the healthcare that people actually want. Ready to roll up your sleeves, look at the world a little differently, and explore the frontiers of consumer health together? Join us. This is the Healthcare Wrap. Welcome back. I'm Jared Johnson, ready to share some more provocative thinking about building the healthcare of tomorrow. This season, we're attempting the deepest dive that's ever been done on the disruptive organizations that are likely to impact the experience of healthcare consumers for years to come. For more provocative thinking, we hope you'll follow us and check out our previous episodes, all 200 of them. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. So here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about new consumer segments. What does Monocle's latest research report tell us about the healthcare brand experience? I'll talk about that. Then we continue our focus on pay providers by welcoming Beth Bierbauer. Beth is in the house to catch us up on the consumer first aspects of pay providers from their dualistic business models to how they employ experience design. All right, it's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the week. If there's one thing we keep learning about consumers' health behaviors, it's that one size does not fit all. One of the tenets of consumer transformation is understanding consumers, not just by demographics, but by behaviors, which the industry continues to learn is a better way of segmenting and targeting. Why? Because we've learned that we make a lot of assumptions about consumers, including thinking that their healthcare behaviors are static. But the winds of change have been blowing steadily these last couple of years, haven't they? And that's why Monogle's new research caught my attention. The newest healthcare edition of their humanizing brand experience research report reveals that new consumer segments have emerged. The report refers to the fact that it's delivers unprecedented data and actionable insights on emerging consumer trends, needs, and behaviors that have arisen in healthcare as we begin to leave the pandemic behind us. In previous editions of the report, they identified health consumer segments such as wellness influencers who, like they sound, are centered on wellness in every aspect of their lives, as well as habitual strugglers, another segment appropriately named, referring to those with chronic conditions who have an inconsistent and in many ways ineffective relationship with providers. What drew me into this latest version of their report was their descriptions of two segments in particular, positive preventives and whole health managers. Positive preventives account for 15% of the population and they're described as happy, sociable, and in good health. They have an optimistic outlook on their health and on life in general. They also credit themselves completely for their good health. But the reality is that they aren't quite as active or living as healthy a lifestyle as they lead others to believe. Where they do excel is their engagement with preventive care. Whole health managers account for 13% of the population, and they believe that they can absolutely be the master of their own care. They're fiercely self-reliant and confident in their abilities to manage their health through the resources available to them online. They trust themselves way before anyone else to keep their health on track. They tend to hold off on traditional medicine in favor of self-care and holistic health management through clean eating, exercise, and a variety of therapies and activities that keep their mind, body, and spirit well. What's more, they're skeptical of traditional doctors and prescription-centric medicine and typically turn to them only as a last resort. The other thing that drew me in was the distribution. Of the seven segments that they identified, none are greater than 20% of the population, and none are fewer than 11%. Clearly, we have our work cut out for us as we work to create products, services, and experiences that are consumer first, because that means different things to different segments of people. It's time to better understand consumers on a one-to-one level so we can engage with them, design for them, and build for them, which are the building blocks for consumer-first health. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the flavor of the Week. The flow, the flow, the flow. 
All right, let's get into the flow, everybody. Give it up for Beth Bierbauer. Beth is in the house with us today. Beth is a sought-after thought leader on, on consumerism and host of the Bee Time podcast. Beth has served for more than 30 years for many of the top payers across the country, including her most recent role as president of Humana's Employer Group segment. Welcome, Beth, to the Healthcare Wrap. Thank you, Jared. Thanks for having me. Well, tell us, let's start off. What did I miss in your bio? What else would you like our listeners to know about you and your background? Well, I would just say that I have been in the payer world for well over 30 years. We'll leave uh, the number at that. And I have really had the opportunity to work in a variety of segments, whether it was with commercial members or Medicare members, Medicaid, even the military. So it's really been very eye-opening, especially from a consumer experience perspective, to be able to have worked in each of those segments and understand the uniqueness of those members. There's a lot to that. (laughs) I can't wait to unpack this with you. Let's start off with just something that helps us get to know you a little bit better. Can you tell us someone that you look up to and why this can be personally or professionally, but just, just someone who comes to mind? You know, I really respect people that are very straightforward and honest, transparent. And years ago, when I was very young in my career, I had a wonderful mentor by the name of Dr. Bob Shabon. And he gave me some pretty direct feedback that while it was a little bit painful to receive at the time, it was absolutely what I needed to hear. And uh, he did it out of the goodness of his heart. And I just think that a leader that can be honest with you is just really meaningful and can help so many people going forward. So I would say Bob Shabon, because he really shaped my career by giving me, um, I wouldn't say tough love, but maybe maybe a light tough love, if you will. So I really appreciate the honesty that, that he provided me. Well, I think that's amazing that something like that sticks with you over the years. And at the time, maybe it wasn't something that was the favorite thing that happened, but that sounds like a pretty amazing opportunity and an example of leadership. So thank you for sharing that. That just helps us see, you know, what types of things shape our careers and our lives, quite frankly. And I really enjoy finding out things like that from people. So Beth, where we're going to go today is talking about pay providers and really we'll broaden that out to payers in general. I think the major payers who are out there and some of the the things we've learned about consumer experience and the intersection of the two. And the context is that as we talk during this season about the disruptors, the I'd consider that all the organizations that are likely to impact the experience of healthcare consumers for the next several years. It's pretty open ended, but there are definitely some organizations that just have that in their DNA. They've made those moves. They act differently. They have a different mindset about care itself. And they bring that mindset to the table when they're talking about how is somebody going to experience a part of their encounter with a consumer. So when we talk to provider organizations, we go down that path a lot of times relating to maybe a patient experience or prior to becoming a patient, what's it like to interact with that health system? I think this is going to be a really interesting counter side to that, if you will, because there's so much that goes on behind the scenes in my mind. So I'm, I'm going to learn a lot here, but I wonder maybe a start a good starting point is just to Give us a, a, a description of, of payers and, and maybe if there's an understanding of, of what a pay vitor is. It's a it's a relatively new term to me, so that's why you know I kind of say it with a grain of salt. But is are there things that define a pay vitor versus a traditional payer? And what are some of those differences? Sure. So originally a pay provider, most people thought of that as a health system that then became a health plan or they took a risk from a health plan. But I would expand that out and say many payers are pay providers now as well because they have gotten into care delivery. So I now define a pay provider as any organization that assumes some type of risk but also is providing care delivery. Now, you mentioned something about what does that experience look like? Does it differ when you're with a provider versus when you're encountering a payer? And Jared, it really, really does. And I think this is one of the reasons why health plans are becoming pay providers, if you will, because they know that if they can capture, for lack of a better term, the patient earlier in the process, they can really improve their health, their health outcomes. So let me give you an example. Patients slash members of Kaiser, they love Kaiser. Really high net promoter scores. You know this. You do, you take a look at all that research because when people are visiting their Kaiser health plan doctor, They don't see it as their health plan. 
They see it as their doctor. And pushing all that stuff, that insurance stuff to the background really helps make for a better experience. If you talk to a Kaiser Health Plan member or even a UPMC or an Intermountain, they say, well, I just go to the doctor and I, I pay my copay. And they don't feel like they're dealing with all this claims and prior authorizations. All those things are really handled and, and integrated in the experience and often pushed to the back. So all that the patient really feels for the most part is that they were able to go see their doctor, get a diagnosis, get the treatment that they needed, get the prescription that they needed. However, when they think about encountering a health plan, what they think about is, oh, prior authorization, denials, high deductibles, right? So they think about the insurance aspect of it. So in order to really bring care and insurance together, you're now seeing health plans purchase primary care physicians, urgent care centers, right? They're all, almost all of them have their own PBM, right? Their own pharmacy benefits management organization because they're really trying to more deeply integrate that experience. But what I'll tell you is, the consumer is really still, though, feeling the disparity between a pay provider that really started as a health system and a pay provider that started as a health plan. They get that traditional experience when they go to the provider's office that's truly integrated as a health plan. If they're in the world of Kaiser, they're feeling really good. If they're in the world of UPMC or Intermountain, they're feeling pretty good. Now, some of the newer pay providers... You know, they're still working through some things because some of these others have been doing it for like 30, 40, 50, 50 years. On the health plan perspective, though, they still really need to focus on that consumer experience. They focus on customer service. But Jared, you and I both know customer service is not customer experience. So there's a long way to go there. They have to really start to think about the customer and what the customer wants from them and expects from them and how the customer wants to deal with them. And as health plans, we have a hard time doing that because we're all living on these legacy systems that are 50 years old that started as insurance systems, transactional systems. So it's often very difficult to try to have digital transformation on top of a platform like that. But back to the fundamental question is, providers are really any organization that both takes risk or in, insures and offers care delivery. So that leaves it wide open, Jared, <laughs> for a lot of different organizations out there nowadays, more and more and more. Yeah, I'm intrigued by the difference you set up between those that started off as a health plan and those that started off as a yeah, as a health system of any kind, a provider organization. Are you seeing pay providers do that intentionally? Like are they are they truly trying to design an experience that is helpful to consumers? I think pay providers when you start with the traditional term where they started as a health system, they are designed around the care. They are designed around the provider. Now, that doesn't sound very consumer-centric, and quite frankly, it isn't consumer-centric. So that's one thing that they have in common with the health plans. Neither one of them are really starting from a consumer-centric place. The difference with a provider-based pay provider is that in order to make the care as efficient for the provider as possible— It also helps the member. So as an example, if I go to my primary care office and she says, Beth, you need to see a cardiologist, that front office will make the referral for me, right? They'll say, Beth, stand here. I'll call now. I'll schedule the appointment. Ask your health plan to make an appointment with a cardiologist. Not going to happen, right? Maybe they'll help you look it up over the over the phone in, in the directory, but then they'll read a large disclaimer to you that says, but if they're not a network at the time you actually go for the visit, right, then the claim isn't covered. So two very different experiences, but by the nature of the fact that the pay provider basis of provider is trying to make things efficient for the provider, they help move that member along in the system. Now, where provider-based pay providers really fall down is the technology, right? And I got to bring this up. The fax is dead. The provider health systems don't seem to know that, right? When they ask you, could you fax that to me? And I'm going, I don't have a fax. I 
<laughs> I can email to you if you give me an email address. Oh, no, no, no. You can fax it. That's all we can take is fax or snail mail. So they have to be able to improve on the technology front. But because they are trying to be efficient, that primary care doc or that specialist doc is saying to his or her staff, you need to schedule them for an x-ray. You need to schedule them for an MRI. I need some blood work drawn. And people hop to it. And so they help that member move along that process. When you call the health plan because you don't understand that, you know, that explanation of benefits that says this is not a bill, but it sure looks like a bill. It's, well, this is all I can tell you. You have to go back to the provider. If you don't think this is right, then you have to appeal. It's you have to, you have to, you have to. So it's sort of a singular experience on the health plan side. And, and, and as I said, I'm a health plan person. And so, but that's really where we can improve. We sort of, in this industry, every other industry tries to take the burden off the consumer. This is the only industry where we really put a burden on the consumer. The providers still do it. They do it with their lack of technology. But if you set that aside, they're much more advanced than what we see on the health plan side. It's still very much on the backs of the consumer. And both aspects can really warrant some improvement. Well, I guess the benefit of having the bar so low is that there's usually some low-hanging fruit <laughs> to kind of uh, check off and, and get some momentum behind us or, or learn how to improve the way that we design and experience uh, when this is the case, like you said, when there's so much room to grow. Maybe that leads me to this thought of, I'm, I'm sure there are things that providers do well and, and some things that they definitely can show some improvement in. What are some things that come to mind? Like what are pay buyers doing well when it comes to experience design? And then where can they show improvement? Yeah, I think uh, what they're doing well is really communicating with other providers in the system. If somebody makes a referral, they're typically getting notes back. I mean, you know, for years now, providers have said, listen, if you're not going to give me information back about my patient or you're going to start ordering additional tests without my knowledge, then I'm not going to refer to you anymore. So I think providers have really stepped up their game in terms of really being very cooperative and sharing that information. And of course, electronic medical records have has really, really help that. Again, where they need some improvement is there is some burden they do place on members. Let me give you an example. I moved to Florida a couple years ago, and now is the first time I have to get my mammogram in Florida. And I called, looked it up in my provider directory, and I, I called and they said, um, well, you're going to have to get the last two two mammograms you had and the report and bring it in. And I said, what what do you mean? I said, well, you're going to have to get it on a CD-ROM, which, you know, we don't use anymore, right? And you're going to have to bring it in. So go get it. I said, well, gee, I had it in another state. They said, okay, well, you'll have to call. So I said, well, isn't that something that you do? And can't you have that transferred electronically? And what I was told by the receptionist is, oh, no, we don't have time to do things like that. You have to do that. And so I went, we don't have time to do things like that. So, of course, I called, took, waited six weeks, didn't get anything in the mail, called again. So finally they got what I needed. And only now am I allowed to make an appointment at the mammogram place. I wasn't even allowed to make an appointment until I had the other documents in my hand. So they were mailed to me. So I'm going to carry the CD-ROM with me. to the provider office. So when I think about this age of technology, right? I mean, I can I can push a button. I can pull up the Uber app, right? Or the Lyft app or whatever car service app on my phone and get a car. But yet I have to do all this phone calls and faxes and paperwork just to get routine mammogram reports transferred. So the technology aspect from a consumer perspective, that's really where the provider system can use improvement. And I, I'm going to tell you, if they can nail that, coupled with the fact that they really do help you move through the system, right? Because people hop to it when provider wants labs and x-rays and things like that done. It'll be a no-brainer. It'll absolutely be a no-brainer. Stay tuned for more provocative thinking after the break. Hey, listen up, y'all. Did you know that nearly 60% of people wish their healthcare provider sent them more relevant health information? And 42% would even consider switching to a different provider that sent them more, according to a recent survey of patients in the U.S. The vast majority of them would prefer to get that information via email or text. Persado is a natural language AI company that provides healthcare organizations with pre-developed, pre-optimized messaging journeys proven to build digital relationships, improve health goals, and increase patient retention, deliver better health outcomes, and 
rapid revenue growth with Persado's data-driven content that inspires action. Visit persado.com to learn more. That's persado, P-E-R-S-A-D-O.com to find out how Persado can help. Justin Knott here with the Patient Convert Podcast, your weekly dose of healthcare marketing growth strategies, co-hosted by Justin and Kelly Knott. This is perfect for physicians, practice owners, healthcare entrepreneurs, and healthcare executives. We are breaking down what practices and healthcare organizations should be doing to grow, reach, and retain patients. There's so much confusion and so many options out there around what you should be focusing on to grow your practice, and we're breaking down each week what really works. We're bringing real-world application, case studies, and interviews from leading growth-minded physicians and healthcare executives. So catch us weekly on your favorite listening platforms, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google. Okay, back to the flow. You know, I like to think about things as opportunities. And I like how you really describe that as, you know, if they can nail that, think about how that can improve this experience. And I also like how you compared automatically, this is what we do these days. You compare directly to Uber. That's what we do. We don't wake up in the morning as a consumer of healthcare and think, I'm going to think about my healthcare experience in a different way than all the other things I experience in my life today. We think about them all the same. We compare them constantly. And I'm hoping that we can kind of ingrain that a little bit more in the culture of, of leadership in healthcare. And I, I know that's not easy. I just, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if you feel the same way. Like, is that important just to recognize that we are comparing constantly to, to brands outside of healthcare? I think it's important because a lot of times healthcare leaders say, but this is healthcare. It's different. But I, what I'm starting to see, and, and you talk about opportunities is again, when I moved here, I needed to find a new dentist. It was the most seamless experience that you would ever imagine. I did reach out to my old dentist and said, hey, they would like the x-rays. Literally, by the time I hung up, x-rays were in my inbox, which then I forwarded to the new dentist who sent me a form to fill out online, so no brown clipboard when I got there. And that was it. It was done. And they text me now to confirm my appointments. I can make appointments online. So we are starting to see some of the stuff in the periphery. The one thing I would share with you is that as healthcare leaders, what we have to think about is not only does this improve the customer experience when they can start to to take advantage of the technology that we already use, you mentioned it, Jaron, our phones, but it actually improves efficiency in the office. There isn't any reason why you shouldn't be allowed to let consumers schedule their own appointments. There just isn't any any reason for that. Why do you have to have a physical human being doing doing that, right? They can block out certain times of your schedule. And if you have a last-minute emergency, you can still have somebody there to call and say, hey, we have to cancel your appointment or send out the email to say this. But you can really allow your staff to start to practice at the top of their license by giving them technology that the consumers can use. So I think as healthcare leaders, we have to understand that When we empower consumers with technology that they're familiar with, they're not going to abuse it. And I think that's a concern. People think, oh, they're going to abuse it. They're going to get confused. And sure, right, Jared, we know there are some people that are confused by by technology. So it isn't an either or. It isn't all or nothing. It's, look, let's have this as an option for people who can use it. And you're going to see over time that it's going to make your life easier and your, your patient's life easier. So I'm seeing coming in the peripheries. We just have to get it to the to the heart of healthcare. Oh, for sure. Like you said, we've got to take this and, and bring it to scale. What I have found when working with a lot of providers over the years, I used to wonder, is there a reason why we're not doing this with a better technology? And it was easy to say, oh, just providers don't want to use new technologies. And I've what I've what I've learned over the last several years is that actually providers are often some of the early adopters of new technologies, as long as it's something that makes sense to them. If the business value is explained to them, if it's explained to them how it's going to change or improve, like you mentioned, like improving the workflow of the office or of any of their administrative functions, this is going to reduce that. 
I have found most providers to be pretty willing to try something new. It's just when there's an unnecessary burden placed on them that has not been explained, that's been dictated to them, that they've been told you have to do this without any of that, that it's 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 harder for them to adopt it. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And that also leads me to think about a quote, or I guess just a, a theme I've heard recently from a few industry insiders who have all described a need for more competition and coopetition. I agree with this. There's just a sentiment out there that there's a need for more competition and coopetition in order for the industry to, to really build systems, like business systems and experiences that, that are going to be good for a consumer. I don't know if payviders play a role in that process, and I don't even know if there's one direction to go with that, but I definitely see a need for more, more competition and more, more coopetition. So more partnerships that benefit to entities that would normally be competitive, maybe in other spaces. I feel like payviders are a pretty good example of that when in a recent episode where we discussed United Health Group, they are coopetition to a T <laughs> in my mind. Uh, so many of their contracts, they service their competitors. So do you see payviders playing a role in creating more competition that makes sense for different sides? And if so, is there anything you're seeing there? That's a lot of good good points in there. So let me talk about the co-optition first. I believe that with health plans purchasing provider practices, I think they're really starting to see the idea of how valuable it is to have access to data the providers have. And so when I think about co-optition and I think about, you know, typically us versus them and now us versus them has to work together, right? I, I think that now they can start to see, wait a minute, this really is valuable to have this information. So how do we, how do we really think about sharing? Because in the past, each party said, ah, our greatest asset is our data and we're not going to share it. Remember, for years, health plans couldn't get any access to any electronic medical records, right? And, and it was like a moat around those systems and even providers couldn't ex- exchange information. And so I think data exchange is just really one area where that can really open up from a co-optician perspective because it's all about benefiting the patient, number one. And quite frankly, it isn't the data. It's what you do with the data that really creates the competitive advantage, right? So if everybody has the same data, you're going to differentiate yourself because you're thinking about it differently. You're looking at it differently. You're modeling it it differently. And then when I think about competition, quite frankly, I love the fact that there are so many new entrants coming into Medicare Advantage, coming into Medicaid, just coming into the healthcare system. When I think about new PBMs being created, Created, or, you know, Amazon buying pill pack and Amazon doing telehealth and talking about Amazon care. And I saw a Walmart van drive by me the other day. This is Walmart plus, you know, we're in your home or something like that. It said, so I love the fact that these competitors are saying, wait a minute, we have strong consumer relationships. Healthcare spend is so big. How do we get into that angle? And what I love about that is, These are game changers. If you think about Amazon, I mean, look, they were what? They were in business nine years, I think, before they turned a profit. I think five of those years, they were a publicly traded company, right? But they kept pushing and pushing and pushing and said, we are going to focus on the consumer. Wall Street, we know you want a profit, but we're going to continue to focus on the consumer, which they continue to do today, right? They'll sit there and say, hey, we're taking a billion dollars and we're going to invest it over here. I love the fact that some of these companies are coming in because they really are consumer champions. They are the companies that say, I can make this better for a consumer. And they have this mindset that says, it's broken, I'm going to find a way to fix it. And I think anytime you have any type of thought processes entering an industry like that, it's got to be good for the industry. And look, they're not perfect. And nobody says they're going to succeed at everything that they do, but they're trying to change the game. And that's what we need. We need the game change. This isn't, the health system shouldn't be about a provider. It shouldn't be about a health plan. It should be about the patient and making that patient experience financial, interaction-wise, outcome-wise, as optimal as possible. And with some of these new thinkers that are coming into the marketplace, including startups, I think we're going to start to see that. So I'm all about competition. I think it's a really, really good thing. And I hope, I hope they keep on coming. 
Uh, anyone who's listened to the show knows that we're, we're big fans of understanding where those opportunities are, but ultimately to see the types of transformation that have happened and the new types of care that are offered now by some of these new entrants, uh, that, that's where we're paying a lot of attention. So I just have one more question for you. What do you hope healthcare looks like, say, three years from now? I think what we're going to see in a couple of years is more advances in underlying technology that is going to improve the customer experience. Transparency, we know that the administration is pushing hard on price transparency as an example, letting people see what's behind the curtain, making sure that they don't have to fill out that brown clipboard or fill out the same information when they go from office to office to office, being able to truly port their medical records. Right, What happens right now? Well, I have medical records sitting back in Ohio. Now I'm going to have a new portal down here in Florida, right? All that information should be in one place and it should be in one place of, of my choosing. So I think that's going to be critical. I think we are going to see more and more companies that are going to come in and say, how do I lift the burden off the consumer? How do I take this excessive processes and make them simpler? So I think we're going to see more on the consumer side. And then I also think that because we have so many people entering the healthcare space, because they look at it and say, some of them come in and say, there's a lot of money there, right? But when they come and they say, we ought to be able to do something that's game changing. I just think we are going to see more and more cures, more and more moonshots that organizations like Startup Health and others are are putting out there. I just think we are going to see the opportunity for people that are dealing with rare diseases to finally find relief, finally find some cures, people living, people living with diabetes. We're now talking about reversing type 1 diabetes. So I I think they're just, we're going to see more around the cure part. And I think we're also going to start to see more around what prevention really means. Today, prevention means I go get a mammogram. Prevention means screening to a lot of folks, right? From an insurance perspective, it really is about a screening. And I just think that more and more people are interested in their health. And so I love these new apps that are coming out that say, you can do a blood test at home for food sensitivities, right? You can actually now get a glu- like a glucose monitor so that you can see what foods spike your blood sugar when you when you eat them. I also see more engagement by consumers who are saying, wait a minute, I want to understand more about the science. I just don't want to follow the food pyramid because I'm not sure the food pyramid's right anymore, right? Depending on who you who you talk to. So I think we're going to see more engagement by consumers and technology and great consumer experiences is what is going to make that engagement happen. So I'm really excited. Better consumer experience, better consumer engagement, and just better outcomes for some of these major illnesses and conditions that people have. So I think it's really exciting. I think it's an exciting place to be. Well, thanks for sharing that. It's amazing how I think some of those things will be rolled in together and ultimately lead to better outcomes. Beth, thanks for giving us so much to think about today. What's the best way for listeners to connect with you if they'd like to reach out to you? Is that on LinkedIn or, or uh, we definitely want to mention the podcast? Where can they find that? Thank you. So Be Time with Beth Bierbauer is the podcast. It's B-Time, T-I-M-E, and it's on all the major podcast platforms. And you can just reach me at BethBierbauer.com. Sounds great. Uh, Thanks again. Stay safe. Best of luck with everything you've got going on. And uh, thanks for giving us some time today. All right. Thank you, Jared. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again. Thank you.